Hello, my name is Mr. Walker, and I teach IB Physics at Rentry High School. Today I'm just going to be doing a short presentation uh, talking about science and how it relates to TOK. Okay, so um, in this uh, presentation, some of the things you're going to learn about or hear about are the different properties of a scientific theory, uh, the scientific method and how knowledge developed in science, and then an example of how a scientific theory can be modified over time. So the first thing I want to talk about is what, what are some of the characteristics of a scientific theory? And this is something that's important to know because um, a lot of the times we, we don't talk about this in science. Um, and a lot of people get the wrong idea about what, what science can and cannot um, address. Okay, so uh, scientific theory in general has to meet, you know, different criteria. Um, two of the most important criteria that a scientific theory has to meet are it has to be able to make falsifiable testable predictions about a physical phenomenon. In other words, if you have a scientific theory, you have to be able to use that scientific theory in some way to um, make a testable prediction um, or a falsifiable prediction. So in other words, um, you know, you can use that for, for the basis of creating an experiment. Um, if you think about like, let's say you have a scientific theory of gravity and you, you make a prediction that when you drop an object, it's going to take this many seconds to hit the ground. Okay, that is a testable prediction. Okay, that's something you can test, and, and either the the test will match your prediction or it won't. And it also has to be able to make false viable claims that are proven or that could be proven incorrect through experimentation. Okay, so again, if you make a, a prediction that my falling object is going to take this many seconds to hit the ground. Um, that is a falsifiable claim because when you actually do the experiment, um, either it's it's um, it matches with that or it's not. It's something that could be proven uh, or could be shown to be false. Okay, the second uh, criteria a scientific th theorem has to meet is that it has to be consistent with ex number one ex existing experimental data. Okay. Um, Within the uncertainty of that data, and if you if you take an IP physics and you know about uh, uncertainty in measurements, and so that means that that typically you, you develop scientific theory after some some type of experimentation has already been done, and you basically when you're building your theory you have to make sure that it, it incorporates the experimental results that have been done in the past. Okay, so it's it's kind of like backwards testing. Like if you you know if if people all, all over the world have done you know th this many experiments with falling objects, then when you come up with your scientific theory, um, it should be consistent within the uncertainty of the measurements, it should be consistent with those that experimental data that already exists. Okay. And so I'd say that that, that first bullet point is, is one of the um, the more important aspects of science that a lot of people don't understand is that science when you're talking about a scientific theory, you have to deal with falsifiable testable predictions. And so a lot of people conflate science and religion um, when, when really they, they have nothing at all to do with each other because you can't, you can't create an experiment or you can't come up with a falsifiable test um, where religion is the basis for that. Okay? Likewise, a lot of people have issues with, you know, what, what, what happened before the, the, the Big Bang? Like science can't tell us anything about what happened um, before the Big Bang happened. And, and a lot of people point to that as, as a failing of science, when in, in reality, um, it's not because we, we, we can't make a, a testable prediction um, based off of what we think might have happened before uh, the Big Bang occurred because the laws of phys physics as we currently understand them did not exist at that time. Okay, and so that, I, I wouldn't say has nothing to do with, with science, but it's outside the scope of what science can and cannot tell us. Okay, um, and again, these are not the only criteria that scientific theory has to meet, but these are two of the more important ones. Okay, these criteria, by the way, um, the fact that the basis is physical phenomena and experimental data, that makes kind of um, science kind of unique and in the sense that when we, when we say we know something in science, the basis for that is, is something observable and tangible um, and oftentimes quantitative. Okay, now we're going to watch a short video clip from um, Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is one of my favorite physicists of all time. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for Physics in the 60s. 
Um, if you're in IV physics too, then you know about Feynman diagrams. That's something he came up with. Um, really awesome guy. Um, and so this is just a very short clip about him talking about the scientific method. And he's speaking to some students at Cornell University. Obviously, the video clip is very old. Um, but listen to what he has to say about the scientific method as he describes it. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com well, don't laugh. That's what really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what if this is right. If this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply, and then we compare those computation results to nature, or we say compare to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. OK, so that's Feynman talking about the scientific method. And in his last statement, he kind of touches on the, the key element to what makes science works um, is that it is um, it all comes down to what the experimental evidence says. Okay, it doesn't matter how smart you are who comes up with the scientific theory. If it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. Okay, and so that's coming from you know a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist right there. In other words, what he's saying is that all scientific theories, no matter how how awesome we think they are, are subject to revision based off experimental evidence only. Okay, and so this helps to minimize bias, not remove it, but minimize bias in scientific results. Okay, and, and, and the idea of this is, is really interesting because science as it works in this way um, is fairly recent. Um, having experiment be the basis of, of scientific knowledge only goes back a couple hundred years to, you know, maybe around the time of Galileo or so. Um, and so since, since the advent of, of this scientific method that he described, um, we as a society and we, we as like a, a global community have, have really advanced uh, our knowledge about the world and, and how it operates. Okay, so this is just a very, very brief explanation of, of how science works in practical terms. Okay, so generally speaking, if you're a scientist, either, you know, you work by yourself or you work with a another group of scientists, let's say you, you perform an experiment or you make a new, new discovery or you know you analyze um, experimental results and you come up with a new hypothesis or a new scientific theory. So typically what you would do then is you would take your results and you would try to publish your results in a scientific journal to communicate those results to other scientists. Now normally what ha will happen is the editor of that scientific journal will assign a what's called a referee um, to review your findings and see whether or not it is acceptable to publish. Okay, and so this referee is typically somebody else in your field who might be an expert in your field and would be able to kind of assess whether or not you, your your findings are reliable, whether or not you you know did everything carefully and you have valid conclusions. And so this is kind of like peer review built into the scientific process where something can't even be published without you know other people taking a look and, and, and at least making sure it makes sense. Now assuming the results do get published, assuming it passes through the referees and, and they say it's okay to publish, what what's very typical is that other scientists are going to go out to try to replicate your results. And if, if they can't replicate your results then um, that's a problem, okay, that's bad for you. Um, that means either they're doing something wrong or uh, there was something wrong with your initial results. Um, and then if they if they do the experiment themselves and, and they get results that are similar to yours, that doesn't prove that you were correct. All that does is it helps support your scientific theory. Okay, you cannot prove anything in science. You can disprove things. We talked about you know making falsifiable claims a few slides ago, but you cannot prove anything to be correct in science. Okay, even the most well-regarded scientific theory at the end of the day is subject to experimental um, verification. Okay, and if you do an experiment that doesn't fit with that scientific theory, then either you have to throw that theory out or at least modify it. And so this is one way where science has kind of like a built-in system where, you know, bad science or false results um, 
can you know not even uh, make it to publication um, and so science kind of like I said ha has a built-in uh, safeguard against biases and, and incorrect information let me give you a specific example in the late 1600s this awesome guy named Isaac Newton published um, his law of gravity in his famous book Principia he actually had you know, three laws of motion, and then a fourth law, which is his law of gravity. Um, without going into too much detail, um, it, it basically states that all mass attracts all other mass in the universe in a very specific way. Okay, if you were to write it as an equation, it would look something like, um, let's say, the, the force of gravity between two masses is equal to a constant, big G, times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between the two masses um, squared. And so that's basically Newton's law of gravity. Um, now, the thing about Newton's law of gravity is it is consistent with existing experimental data. And without going into too much detail, it can make a lot of predictions that are con confirmed by experiment. Okay, obviously, you know, it predicts objects falling, but if you use this law to calculate the period of, let's say, the moon around the Earth or the moon of Jupiter um, around Jupiter or, you know, different things that you can observe easily with a telescope, if you use this law to calculate those things, um, then it's actually pretty consistent, okay? And, and a lot of discoveries were made uh, using... Newton's law of gravitation. In fact, um, the planet Neptune, I believe, was discovered mathematically before it was actually observed because they were able to notice that that the the orbits of you know like Uranus uh, didn't match up with with what Newton's law predicted, and so they were able to hypothesize that there must be another planet out there, and they were able, able to do calculations and know where to point the telescope, and that's how they discovered that planet. Okay, and so Newton's law. Um, like I said, was consistent with a lot of experimental data. All right? It can also be used uh, to show mathematically that planets should travel in elliptical orbits, which is also consistent with observations that had been made at the time. Okay? And I said it was able to make predictions, um, which is always a, a key element of the scientific theory. It has to be able to make you know, testable, falsifiable predictions. Now, does that mean that Newton's law is proven correct and we never look at it again? No, because everything in science is subject to review. So, a couple hundred years go by, late 1850s, um, and some people noticed that if you map out the orbit of the planet Mercury, um, if, you, if you look at Mercury um, throughout the course of, of one, one of Mercury's years, it goes around the sun one time in one orbit, and the shape of the orbit is something like this. It's an egg shape. It's, it's technically an ellipse. And if you make measurements over many, many, many years, um, and they're very careful measurements, what they noticed was that the orbit of Mercury actually rotates. Okay, and so you can kind of see that in that in this diagram to the right. This is called the precession of the uh, perihelion of Mercury. If you want to look it up, okay. And so you know, of course, what they did at the time is they tried to use Newton's law to explain this. And so what they did was they said, well, maybe. Um, Maybe the, the, the orbit of Mercury is, is uh, rotating because of all the other planets in the sun are pulling on it. And so th they did their calculations to, to see if that would affect it. And, and it would, but not to the degree that would completely explain their observations. Okay? It was able to explain most of it um, if you take into account all the other planets in the solar system, but not completely. However, um, this guy named Albert Einstein came up with a brand new theory of gravity, and his theory of gravity is called general relativity. Um, that was published in 1916. And not only was he able to, um, or people were able to use general relativity to explain this precession precisely within the uncertainty of the measurements, but it was also to, uh, it was, they could also use general relativity to kind of backwards um, predict everything that Newton's law had predicted. So in other words, it was it was more correct than Newton's law of gravity was. Okay, so Newton's law of gravity was awesome for most things, but this this one tiny sensitive thing it couldn't explain, whereas general relativity um, could cover basically everything. Okay, the current understanding of gravity still falls under general relativity. And so since 
Einstein came up with that. We've not come up with a better theory of gravity. Not that we're not looking, um, but it, it's, it's working pretty well for us to now, or it's working pretty well for us up to this point in time. Um, and in fact, we, we can even have awesome technology like GPS thanks to general relativity. So does that mean Newton's law of gravity is wrong? Yeah, but um, huh, this is just a, a funny, funny slide. Um, a funny picture that I was sent. Okay, so does that mean that Newton's theory of gravity is wrong? Yes, but it's still good enough to teach in high school because you, you know we talked about it in IB physics. Um, and so even though the, the theory of general relativity is more accurate than Newton's law of gravitation, um, the reason it's not normally taught at the high school or undergrad level is because the math involved is very, very complicated. And so Newton's law, even though it's not quote unquote correct, I don't want to really say that because you can't prove anything to be correct in science, um, but it's good enough for most calculations that we would want to do. Okay, so for example, if we didn't have general relativity, we could still, for example, send send a, a rocket to the moon and land land people on the moon. Okay, it's not good enough to have GPS, but it's good enough to you know send rockets to outer space and stuff. Okay, so Newton's law was was proven wrong because it wasn't able uh, to explain this this testable theory of the, the precession of Mercury's orbit. It wasn't completely discarded. It was kind of, you know, used to teach people the basics of gravity and then if, if they study physics enough they can learn about general relativity. Also note, and I said this before, but in becoming the established current theory of gravity, general relativity not only had to explain this one tiny thing about Mercury's orbit, but also had to be consistent with all of the other predictions and evidence supported by Newton's law. And so the idea in science is that you're always building in your understanding of things and not necessarily, um, you know, going backwards. Okay, science makes things better. Okay, it makes our understanding stronger. Okay, this is just another quote from Richard Feynman. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure about anything. And just to give you one more taste of, of you know, what science is and how, how it works, I want to play one more video clip about Richard Feynman um, where he's talking about... Um, the loss of science, and, and he, he makes the analogy comparing it to, to chess. Okay, so let's watch this short video clip. It's kind of a fun analogy to try to get some idea of what we're doing and try to understand nature. And just imagine that the gods are playing some great game like chess, let's say a chess game, and you don't know the rules of the game, but you're allowed to look at the board, at least from time to time, and in a little corner perhaps. And from these observations, you try to figure out what the rules are of the game, what the rules of the pieces moving. So you might discover after a bit, for example, that when there's only one bishop around on the board, that the bishop maintains its color. Later on, you might discover the law for the bishop as it moves on a diagonal, which would explain the law that you understood before, that it maintains its color. And that would be analogous to we discover one law and then later find a deeper understanding of it. Uh, then, uh, Things can happen. Everything's going good. you got all the laws. It looks very good. And then all of a sudden, some strange phenomenon occurs in some corner. So you begin to investigate that, to look for it. It's castling, something you didn't expect. That, uh, we're always, by the way, in a fundamental physics, always trying to investigate those things in which we don't understand the conclusions. We're not trying to check all the time our conclusions. After we've checked them enough, we're okay. The thing that doesn't fit is the thing that's the most interesting, the part that doesn't go according to what you expected. In, also, we could have revolutions in physics after you've been noticed that the bishops maintain their color and they go along the diagonals and so on for such a long time and everybody knows that that's true. Then you suddenly discover one day in some chess game that the bishop doesn't maintain its color. It changes its color. Only later do you discover the new possibility that the bishop is captured and that a pawn went all the way down to the queen's end to produce a new bishop. That can happen, but you didn't know it. And so it's a very analogous to the way our laws are. They sometimes look positive. They keep on working, and all of a sudden some little gimmick shows that they're wrong. And then we have to investigate the conditions under which this 
bishop change of color happen, and so forth, and gradually learn the new rule that explains it more deeply. Unlike the chess game, though, in the case of the chess game, the rules become more complicated as you go along. But in the physics, when you discover new things, it looks more simple. It appears on the whole to be more complicated because we learn about a greater experience. That is, we learn about more particles and new things. And so the laws look complicated again. But if you realize all the time what's kind of wonderful, it is as we expand our experience into wilder and wilder regions of experience, every once in a while we have these integrations in which everything is pulled together in a unification, which it turns out to be simpler than it looked before. All right, so I just wanted to show that last video um, from Richard Feib. Okay, so, too long, didn't read. Scientific theories must be able to make testable predictions and are continually developed and refined through the collection of physical experimental evidence. And that's it. Okay, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I hope you all have a great day.